The first um, introduction I'm going to present Dr. Andrew Klein. He is um, um, a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, fellow of Sky, and um, a director of endovascular medicine at Kimmon Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And he is going to talk us about um, the particularities that we have on the uh, PE and uh, in the setting of COVID-19. Thank you. Go ahead, Thank please. You. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Actually, this is, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this over to Jim Horowitz is actually uh, on the peculiar particulars of uh, COVID. Uh, Jim is at uh, New York and uh, I'll let him uh, come on board here. A lot of experience here in the United States with COVID and pulmonary embolism. I think uh, uh, the greatest experience has been in New York City. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jim Horowitz uh, from Langone Medical Center. Jim. Hello, hi, thanks everyone for having me. Um, as you heard, yeah, I'm, from, I'm from New York and we are just sort of now recovering from uh, a rough, rough time with COVID. Um, let me just go back to March. So it's July 1. Uh, if you talk to any of the doctors here, we feel like March uh, was yesterday. The five months has been an absolute blur as we all, you know, the IC docs were all working, you know, nonstop, uh, never taking any time off. And basically all of the major New York City hospitals had a massive expansion of ICU beds. And by massive, I mean, you went from a typical, you know, maybe 55 or 60 beds in the whole building of ICU to, in our, in our case, our, t our peak was 197. And I know 30 blocks north at Cornell, they were over 200, 210, uh, using ORs as, um, as ICU rooms, using EP labs, cath labs, holding areas as ICU rooms. In my place, uh, lots of non-ICU non doctors volunteered most of the cath lab was working with us, either both the nurses and the, um, and the attendings in the ICUs. And you know, back then in March, what we were thinking was, well, we heard in China, people have this horrible respiratory disease. They're intubated for weeks at a time. Everyone gets prone. Uh, ECMO patients don't do well. They have renal failure. And there's a lot of, of, of COVID cardiomyopathy, depressed EF, uh, bad VT, and frankly, we were expecting to see that. And you know, I was in talks with my, my PERT right before this and thinking, and I literally said to all my PE contacts, you know, I think we're gonna go on hiatus for a while because we have to focus on COVID and um, there's not gonna be a lot of PE business um, uh, in, in the near future. And just to go back a sec to the intro, you know, in, in the US and in some other countries, there's been a very rapid expansion of this concept of the Pulmonary Embolism Response Team, or PERT, which is what's on my jacket here. And the idea is that it's kind of akin to a heart team uh, for difficult cardiac cases, where basically the guidelines haven't really caught up to the treatments that are out there. Patients are too complex to, to have just one specialty deal with them. And maybe the disease falls between a couple of different specialties, kind of like these complex heart team patients between cardiology and, and cath lab and, and cardiac surgery. And, um, and more input is needed to help make decisions for these patients. And on the flip side, the other added difficulty or complication of the PERT team is that it has a, um, the, the addition of a rapid response element to it. There's no time to schedule a meeting next Friday to discuss the case. It's like a STEMI team. You have to respond rapidly and see these patients. So as I said, I kind of told our PERT folks that we were gonna go on hiatus for a little bit and deal with this respiratory ARDS ailment. And then little did we know that we were going to then see a rapid influx of patients clotting everywhere, both macro emboli, DVTs, PEs, uh, strokes, uh, but also micro emboli, which were seen on many, many autopsy studies. Uh, this micro angiopathy uh, in, in, in the pulmonary vasculature, all vascular beds, and the idea there's a vascular tropism for this virus, which we frankly did not see coming. Um, and it's a different world now, just a few months later. So this case was literally the first week of COVID um, uh, at my hospital, the uh, medical ICU had four negative pressure beds and they filled within the first day. So day two, they said, where do we put the patients for negative pressure for respiratory isolation? And lo and behold, the cardiac ICU was in the new building 
And so the entire floor could be made negative pressure. So we became pop-off valve on day two, uh, and uh, we rapidly filled my entire floor of 34 beds in just a couple of days. The patients were coming in two, three, four at a time, getting rapidly intubated, uh, max vent settings. It was, it was, it was mayhem. I mean, we, uh, we really had to reevaluate very quickly how we dealt with supplies for intubations, for cardiac arrest, uh, because so many, so many um, uh, of our devices were going in the rooms and getting contaminated. So let me bring you back. This is literally my first day in the COVID ICU. I had a 34-year-old guy who had hypertension. He had spinal fusion from a fall at work. He's a construction worker. And he had, like everyone else, a week of shortness of breath and hypoxia. He came in. His white count was only eight. It was not that elevated. His uh, platelets were 375. He was COVID positive. And when he walked in the door, he was tachypnic to the 40s. And even with a non-rebreather, was only satting 88%. And I should add that in New York at that time, the ED was so overrun that unless you were severely hypoxic, you were sent home uh, and told to self-isolate and, and check in and follow up. Um, so this gentleman was super tachypnic, was, looked very sick, and he got rapidly intubated. Here's his x-ray with diffuse uh, bilateral patchy airspace disease. He got intubated and was brought uh, emergently to the ICU. And these are his labs on, 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 on March 24th. So this is, this is um, his David mission. And, and even back then, we knew that there was a hyperinflammatory state. So we were checking a bevy of these labs, uh, CRP, ferritin, LDH, Procal, Trope, CPK, D-dimer, ESR, fibrinogen. And I don't know if you guys use the same um, um, exact test as us, but I'll tell you that all these numbers are very elevated. Um, the D-dimer is elevated and these are his subsequent days where the, the, these, 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 these inflammatory markers all remained quite elevated. They were coming down slowly. You can see the CRP went down from 180 to just 35. So that's progressing well. The procalcitonin came down as well. And then uh, we hadn't really checked any follow-up D-dimer or ESR or fibrinogen. I will tell you that about two weeks later, we started checking these labs every 48 hours and trending them. Um, and this gentleman, uh, was, as I said, was emergently intubated. By then, uh, we already had four different ICU teams. In the end, we ended up taking over five floors um, and turning them all into COVID ICU uh, uh, rooms. Um, he was given uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin at that point. We have sent, subsequently stopped treating with those drugs. And he was given a dose of tocilizumab, uh, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, as part of a trial. I showed up, I picked him up on hospital day four, um, you know, I'm a cardiologist in critical care, but not a pulmonologist. So I was quickly trying to learn what this disease was, trying to use, you know, the various um, government uh, donated ventilators. And so on day one, for me, I, I weaned his FiO2 from 60% to 50%. I diuresed him a bit. I adjusted his sedation based on the drug, sh the drug shortage, uh, sh shortages of the day. Um, basically, every few days, we'd run out of X, Y, or Z and have to switch to a different uh, sedative. At one point, we were giving, you know, PO uh, Dilaudid uh, to these patients while they're intubated uh, because we were sort of balancing uh, shortages of fentanyl or, or whatever else. And I increased his bowel regimen. I basically thought to myself, no one knows much about this disease, so let me work on the fundamentals of ICU care. So I made sure he had DVT prophylaxis. I made sure he was diuresed. I made sure his bowel regimen was adequate. Um, and then I sat down to write notes. And all of a sudden, I was called to see the patient urgently because he went into an SVT. He was tachycardic to the 140s. We cardioverted him, and then um, he became severely hypotensive. And while we were working him up, I was thinking to myself, what did I, what did I miss? I'm, I'm, new to, I'm new to COVID. I'm not a pulmonologist. Did I, did I do something wrong with the ventilator? Uh, did I miss something? And my fellow just put an ultrasound probe on the patient's chest, and we saw the RV did not look good. And then we saw a glimpse of something in the right atrium. We weren't quite sure if it, what it was. Um, here's an additional image. And you can see, in fact, there is a clot in transit in the RA. And you can see here, I'll play it again. It's actually prolapsing into the RV. And you know, I know there's no staging or grades of clot in transit, but having seen many, many clot in transit, this is a very thick clot in transit. You definitely see lots of small strandy things maybe attached to a dialysis catheter or whatnot, but this thing is large and looks dangerous. Um, and I quickly said to myself, what did I miss? What did I miss? I made sure that he actually was on sub-Q heparin 5000 TID and clotted despite this. And then as you can see here, he quickly arrested. 
uh, we called our ECMO team. They uh, uh, obviously thought that we wanted VV ECMO and said, no, you asked for VA, you want VV. And I said, no, 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 I need VA ECMO. This gentleman has, you know, a clot in transit and presumably a pulmonary embolism on top of it. And before they could even arrive, uh, he arrested. And you can see here, I then switched to a transesophageal echo. Uh, the reason I did that was because I called for the T probe before I had the diagnosis and I had it at the bedside. And then when he arrested, I wanted to get a better look at um, CPR quality, which is a very new idea that um, uh, I only learned about about two years ago. And basically what that means is that, here's another image of that big clot in transit. And here is a, a midesophageal at 120. And you can see in this view, I'm looking at his, his RV, I'm looking at his LV, but this, is, um, this view is actually optimized to look at the CPR quality and to look at the area of maximal compression. So obviously CPR is based on the concept of, of a open chest CPR where literally the surgeon is holding their hands and compressing the heart. Um, but, and and, and um, chest compressions extrapolate that idea to compressing the chest and we don't know exactly what we're compressing. But if you put a transesophageal echo and you can see in this situation, the area of maximal compression, area of maximal compression is probably in the RV, but we're compressing the LVOT severely and you have to ask yourself if, if any blood flow is leaving the LV in this scenario, and perhaps you should change where you put the uh, compressions. And in this case, I had a mechanical CPR device called the Lucas. Um, the Lucas was you know, in the location that the AHA uh, recommends, right in the middle of the chest. So I tried to uh, adjust it. You can see here the LVOT. And I tried to move the Lucas, and then what I got was the heart was just translocating, but not being compressed at all. And I said, well, this probably isn't good either. So then we took the Lucas off and switched to manual compressions and got what we thought was the best um, um, uh, combination of the two. And we got some LB compressions and less LBOT. And I should have added, we had pushed TPA five minutes prior. And so we were giving him another 10, 20 minutes of, of CPR to see if we could get him back and see if the TPA could work. And then despite the TPA and, and the 20 minutes of CPR, uh, the clot was still there. And then eventually uh, the, we, 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 uh, we pronounced him. Oh, here's a view of the T, which shows uh, a PE, probably a saddle PE. And then eventually, uh, since the ECMO team um, did not want to do CP, uh, eCPR on this patient, uh, given the fact that he already rested and had active severe COVID, this is at the end after 20 minutes of CPR. Now the, t the clot in transit is gone, but he's got no, he's got no squeeze. And then we, we pronounced it. Um, the family uh, refused autopsy, uh, which was a shame because we really need to learn more about this disease. Um, we tried our best to, to convince the family, but another very awful thing about this disease is that as soon as it hit New York, the hospital um, did not allow any visitors. So that relationship that you have with the family where you get to know them and they look, get to know who you are and they trust you, you know, um, that you just, it was impossible to establish that um, via, you know, once a day phone calls. And in this case, I think there was some like, there was, they were just distraught, obviously, and, and there's no kind of, maybe there's some distrust and they, they did not want to do autopsy. So uh, it, in the end, we didn't get to find out uh, exactly how diffuse his clot was or if he had the, uh, the microangiopathy that we talked about as well. And then we'll stop my sharing there. And back to you guys. Great. Thanks, Jim. I actually have a, a question for you. So I think one of the take homes to this and I'll go on to tips and tricks during COVID is this is a 34 year old, previously very healthy gentleman, correct? Like pretty active, I believe is from what I remember you discussing in the past. And he was on full dose, 5,000 units, TID, sub Q, uh, anticoagulation. So um, looking back on this, what is your ability now within retrospect of five months to say, what could you do to maybe prevent this from happening? Because uh, I think once you get that clot in transit of that size, I think the, uh, the horse has left the barn per se. Right. You know, it's a really great question and I don't know the answer. I'll tell you that having spoken to folks at a bunch of different institutions, some places, uh, my, my hospital, for instance, started putting all patients with a D-dimer greater than 2,000 on full dose anticoagulation. 
I'm not saying that I, that's the recommendation. Uh, that's what my place did. I'll tell you that MGH did not do that. Cedar sinai did not do that. Um, some folks are using just higher dose prophylactic uh, anticoagulation. Uh, but I will tell you as a little commercial, my, um, uh, at my center, Dr. Jeffrey Berger has initiated the uh, Protect COVID clinical trial looking at exactly that. So we're randomizing patients with D-dimers greater than 500 to uh, full dose anticoagulation versus prophylactic dose. Uh, several other sites have already joined. The NIH is picking up the trial and expanding it. So for now, it's just those two arms, but there will be additional arms looking at uh, probably uh, additional antiplatelets, uh, addition of DOAC, perhaps a, a high dose prophylaxis um, regime, because we don't know. And as we've heard again and again, there's, there's micro and macro clots there's platelets that are not working normally. If uh, there's actually literature that we participated in recently that shows that Rotems done in these patients are severely abnormal. I think we just don't quite understand it yet. So if anybody wants to be involved in this study, uh, you can grab my, my contact info from the organizers. And I'd be happy to connect you with uh, Dr. Berger. Great, thanks, Jim. I'm gonna uh, give some tips and tricks about, about PE, but go ahead, let's, uh, I think we have some other questions. No, I just have another question that it's uh, um, it, about the biomarkers that you're using. Yeah, of course, you said that the dimer is an important one, but what about uh, levels of fibrinogen or what cut of points are you using? I know there's nothing written about that and it's hard to say it, but uh, as you have a lot of experience uh, can you give us a little bit of light about that? Uh, we, you know, we, um, we started following, as you said, uh, D-dimer, CRP, fibrinogen, um, occasionally an IL-6 level, although that was a send out test, uh, CRP, and we, um, this all happened so fast that everybody was basically uh, just kind of, uh, just, making it up in the very beginning. But um, I'll tell you that we quickly uh, started formalizing this. Here's the list again of, of biomarkers we're talking about. And um, we developed a protocol to check them every 48 hours. Now this, uh, it was, I'm sure, was exceedingly expensive and it was based on, on no data. But the nice part is that in this day and age, all of this, uh, all this data is in our, our medical record, which is epic. So our institution has been just going through this data left and right on you know, our thousands of patients and looking to see uh, what it means. And certainly D-dimer is predictive of poor outcomes. Patients whose D-dimers, uh, you know, you can separate by quartiles and it predicts mortality, I, I believe. I believe that's already been published. Um, and there's a, there's a lot to learn in there. Would you... Dr. Klein. Yes, thanks, Jim, and, and thanks, Jorge. I appreciate it. I'm going gotcha. to I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, so we can go ahead and if you guys can see that. Yeah, see my screen, okay? Hopefully. There you go. Yes, we did. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Jim. I'm uh, Drew Klein, an interventional cardiologist and uh, vascular and endovascular specialist in Piedmont Heart Institute here in Atlanta. And a uh, pleasure of following uh, my friend and colleague, Jim uh, Horwitz on this and, and tips and tricks about COVID-19 and, and pulmonary embolism because I think it is something that as Jim mentioned, it's, it's evolving. And I think it's very important to understand exactly uh, how we can work together and learn from each other as we uh, delve into this pandemic. I have no financial disclosures. However, I'm a, a very firm believer in the PERT team concept uh, or pulmonary embolism response team. I think it's critical. Uh, to be able to work as a team uh, across multidisciplines. And when you look at the PER consortium uh, and the meeting that we have annually, and this year will be virtually, it's wonderful to see a whole group of people from hematology, oncology, to pulmonary critical care, to thoracic surgery, to interventional cardiology, to interventional radiology, vascular surgery. You'll see a wide breadth of uh, specialists across the vascular medicine. And so in that regard, you're really seeing a unique disease subset that crosses multidisciplinary uh, domains and allows everyone to work 
closely together in somewhat of an urgent fashion um, as these patients come in often very sick as uh, the case just presented. Uh, my objective today is to discuss COVID-19 and kind of follow up exactly on what Dr. Horowitz had basically said, uh, talk a little bit about the risk factors and why COVID impacts uh, VTE, present a little bit of case, talk about limiting exposure. I think that's uh, critical and then who should get treated. Um, this is a 50 year old male with near syncope and shortness of breath. Uh, presented had no uh, prior medical history and one week of feeling bad had been in bed um, basically immobile temperatures to 103 uh, sounding very similar to COVID uh, loss of taste and loss of smell came in uh, with a blood pressure of 100 over 50 with a heart rate of 120 uh, breathing 32 times a minute on 10 liters non-rebreather he got a CT scan which showed uh, COVID pneumonia plus a CT with a, a saddle uh, pulmonary embolism, his troponin was 1.2, his B-type natriuretic peptide was 600, and he was noted to be COVID positive. So the question is, uh, what do you do? The patient was admitted to the MICU, and uh, we often, for any uh, large pulmonary embolism, will have a PERT team consultation, where we have the surgeon on call doing embolectomy, plus the pulmonologist or ICU doctor along with an endovascular specialist and an R institution that is uh, split evenly between our vascular surgeons and us in interventional cardiology. And we work very closely together as a team. Uh, and that uh, phone call is usually done uh, or virtually, and sometimes we meet at the bedside. And the options were to treat this patient with heparin alone, uh, do uh, give them 100 milligrams of TPA uh, or uh, reduce dose TPA, a 10 milligram pulse push, uh, probably followed by 40 milligrams over four hours, so-called reduced dose uh, lytics. Uh, maybe bring them to the catheterization lab for catheter-directed therapy uh, and give lytics via catheter, either the ECOS catheter uh, or uh, via any infusion catheter, or do thrombectomy, mechanical thrombectomy, uh, or bring them to the operating room for thrombectomy as well. Patient in worsening ABGs and increasing respiratory rate uh, and uh, was intubated in the ICU. So just a briefly here about COVID-19. Uh, we do know it's associated with a, a prothrombotic state. Uh, and part of this is because ICU patients with COVID-19 have major issues, including intubation, sedation, paralysis, and then proning. Uh, there's likely a, a greater incidence of VTE here. It's 25% in one uh, Chinese study. Uh, in the Netherlands study, uh, which was backed up by another Italian study, pulmonary embolism was present in almost 14 to 25% of patients uh, with COVID. So clearly a hypercoagulable state being present in these uh, patient population on top of their immobility. So you have two things going um, against them. In addition, you have this microthrombo uh, embol uh, embolism, uh, basically thrombo, um, angiopathy that occurs, so it really can be an issue with uh, hypoxemia as well as this coagulable state. There's a wonderful paper, if you have not uh, looked at this, this is a kind of a summary a paper looking at COVID-19 that was published in Jack uh, just recently, looking at the variability in resource and testing strategies and contracting COVID uh, after exposure. And then what you see is patients basically climb the ladder. Some, some patients are very mild, some become moderate and severe, and then um, many go on to be, become extremely ill. Uh, right now, we don't know who or what predicts this. Uh, what we do know is that people do get into a situation where they can almost get into DIC as well as uh, so clotting and bleeding at the same time. Uh, we know that increased age is also a risk factor as well as uh, multiple comorbidities. Here's a postulated mechanisms, coagulopathy from the same paper, basically looking at risk factors, inflammatory response. So I think there's a couple things going on here. There's a, the pulmonary microthrombo thrombi, the intravascular coagulopathy, and then myocardial injury, uh, and then increasing biomarkers. So this uh, COVID cardiomyopathy that uh, Jim talked about is a critical thing. So you're battling essentially multiple systems going down at once. In addition, I think you have patients that are having a pneumonia, a superimposed bacterial pneumonia on top of uh, COVID, which uh, just compounds the issue. And then you have your patient that's been sitting there for several days and then has a large pulmonary embolism as seen in this case previously presented. So uh, you're really battling several entities at once here from the ICU care as was nicely illustrated by the case. I think it's important to understand if you're looking at pulmonary embolism where, where you're at uh, in terms of prevalence and mortality, uh, there's low risk, there's intermediate risk, and there's high risk. Uh, really the mortality uh, that we 
we want to focus on those are with high risk or massive PE, uh, that mortality is greater than 30%, and a prevalence, fortunately, uh, relatively low at 5 15%. Now, this is general uh, patient population, uh, not COVID, uh, where we think this is probably a little bit higher. Uh, just to review here, if you're looking at pulmonary uh, embolism categories, there's massive, and this is uh, acute pulmonary embolism with sustained hypotension, as was seen uh, in Jim's case, which is a patient that cardiac arrested, that's uh, pulses, profound bradycardia, or hypoxemia. This is a, a major alert. This is uh, when your patient is either coding already or on the verge. And then there's submassive PE, and this is acute pulmonary embolism without systemic hypotension, but you do have RV dysfunction, as noted by either echo or CT with elevation of biomarkers, BNP or N-terminal BNP, as well as some changes uh, consistent with RV strain. And usually in these cases, you also have myocardial necrosis or elevation in troponin. And then there's low risk PE. Uh, those are basically, you have no biomarkers, you have no RV dysfunction, and these patients do very, very well. So in those categories, massive, submassive, and low risk, uh, really with COVID, you really wanna be thinking only about entertaining, doing something about massive PE. Uh, everyone else, uh, if you look at the data, we don't have anything showing reduction in mortality in patients with submassive or low risk. In fact, low risk, their mortality is very low. And so you would leave it alone. Uh, and really the only patients you want to be focusing on are those patients with COVID and massive PE. Again, looking at the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism, you, it's increased afterload, which then spirals uh, down to decreasing our, uh, increasing RV O2 demand. And then everything kind of spirals out of control where the RV starts compressing the LV, uh, systemic hypotension, decreasing coronary perfusion, and then eventually uh, obstructive uh, shock into death. I think the first thing to understand about COVID, and this is where Sky has uh, really taken a lead, it's uh, based on the Emerging Leaders in Medicine program uh, group uh, from Sky put together relatively rapidly considerations for cardiac catheterization lab procedures during the COVID-19 pandemic. This group uh, led by Molly Zerlup, and I put the hyperlink here, uh, really uh, talks about how to consider what to do in COVID-19. Who do you take to the cardiac catheterization lab? Uh, in that realm and how do you do it? How do you limit the exposure to your lab? Uh, how do you uh, do this in a safe fashion as well, given patients are often unstable? Uh, if you have not uh, read this one by uh, Jeff Barnes, this uh, paper I think is uh, amazing uh, in terms of its anticoagulation forum and guidance. Uh, Jeff is a very active member of our pulmonary embolism response uh, consortium, the PERC uh, consortium and uh, from the University of Michigan. And I'm gonna reference this paper several times, and I think uh, this is one actually uh, worth keeping around as you uh, need to reference it in patients with uh, this disease who present to your hospital. Uh, first of all, how do you diagnose uh, PE in the setting of COVID-19? As Jim mentioned, serial D-dimers. So often what we see here is the patients are doing better from a COVID perspective, and then all of a sudden they deteriorate rapidly, as was seen here on hospital day four. And that's when you know something else is going on. And you can do um, uh, biomarkers, rapid decline. And then I think point of care ultrasound, as was often done here in the United States is critical. And the bedside ability to do ultrasound and look at the RV, and in this case, find a clot in thrombus or a thrombus in transit really uh, hammered down and made that diagnosis. The recommendations from that paper I just showed you were for daily D-dimers and biomarkers. Uh, D-dimer measurement may be uh, used as a marker of illness severity and prognosis. Uh, here at our institution, we actually do follow daily D-dimers and uh, biomarkers. Uh, and really, you shouldn't intensify your anticoagulation dosing just based on biomarkers, but really look for something else, uh, perhaps uh, a bedside echo or a formal echo might be uh, to look for a pulmonary embolism, or as was seen in Jim's case, a TE also would work uh, very nicely to look for a saddle embolism. I think the key thing here uh, with COVID-19 and pulmonary embolism is we'd love to prevent this from happening more than anything, because I think once your patient gets a large pulmonary embolism, you're really in trouble. Uh, these patients are very, very sick uh, to start off with, and then you throw a PE on top of it, and their chances of survival uh, rapidly deteriorate. And so if you look at the recommendations from the Barnes paper, uh, for all non-critically ill patients, those are patients that are on the floor, uh, it's essentially standard dose VT prophylaxis. However, uh, recommendations for the ICU or critically ill patients is to increase it to anoxaparin. And just out of note, I think uh, most of us are using low molecular weight heparin mainly to limit exposure 
and also uh, bioavailability or in terms of constant um, anticoagulation. So really are using low molecular weight heparin over heparin alone. And uh, when I stop, I'll ask if Jim's uh, switched that to as well, or, or you can go to heparin 7,500 sub Q three times a day, or low, in, low dose intensity uh, heparin infusion. That's another option as well. Uh, there is actually one paper looking at Alteplase. It was a, a whopping uh, case series of three patients with COVID-19 and ARDS-related uh, respiratory uh, failure, wherein uh, Alteplase 50 milligrams were basically given. Uh, there were improvements in oxygenation, but very, very transient. Um, TPA for microthromboli currently is not recommended. So clearly what we're seeing here is this microthromboli mycothromboembolism or microthrombi in the small pulmonary arteries, it does not respond well to uh, TPA. So that's uh, currently not uh, recommended. And uh, if you see here from the Barnes paper, they basically not using thrombolytics outside of another clinical indication such as STEMI or myocardial infarction or acute ischemic stroke or massive pulmonary embolism with hemodynamic compromise. So as Jim had mentioned here, TPA was given. I think that is absolutely the right call. I think for patients uh, who are critically ill in the COVID units, I think having TPA nearby and not having to get it from pharmacy is critical. Uh, what about mass PE? Just a touch on this. I think the key thing is to stay calm for patients that have mass PE. If you get a chance, do exactly what Jim did, which upfront stabilization principles. Uh, using, I thought, uh, using the transesophageal echo to uh, monitoring uh, CPR is something I learned from him, and I think that's a great uh, opportunity I don't think many people know about. And I think it's uh, going to be used more often as we see time go on. And then I think your biggest question is, do you move on to mechanical circulatory support? As uh, was noted here, the ECMO team was uh, notified. And we here at Piedmont, uh, our ECMO team is both uh, interventional cardiology and uh, cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, usually it's the interventionalist uh, who are needing it or, or, or still here. And so it's usually us at the bedside putting it in. And I think it's important that you consider your options for definitive therapy in these patients with mass PE, and it's really going to come down to lytics or anticoagulation alone. Uh, most of the time, we're not going to take these patients to catheter-directed therapy or to the operating room. Uh, they're often too unstable to even get down to these locations. Uh, in terms of mass PE, again, just want to go through that volume administration, though it's seldom helpful and potentially harmful. I think this is something everyone's taught in medical school, but if you look at the data, most of these patients have marked markedly elevated CBP elevation, and you may just further overextend the RV, compressing the LV, diastolic compression of the LV. And the CVP that's ideal is somewhere between eight and 15 for massive point PE. I think for any patient with massive PE, we really wanna get your pressors going uh, to maintain adequate cardiac output. And norepi is our kind of goal of choice. Uh, you can consider uh, inhaled nitro, uh, nitric oxide, though the INOP trial was uh, somewhat negative, which actually looked at this. I uh, failed to increase the proportion in patients with normal troponin echo, but it did increase the probability of eliminating RV hyperkinesis and dilatation on echo. So I think it's important to understand that I don't think inhaled nitric uh, for these patients is, is quite dead yet. Uh, really, if you haven't uh, experienced a mass PE, try to avoid intubation if possible. These patients that have, co uh, have COVID are often already intubated or crashing from uh, their COVID pneumonia, not necessarily from their PE. Uh, and then I think the most important thing is to uh, quickly look at any contraindications of thrombolysis. And if uh, you're going to give lytics, stop the heparin, give the lytics, and then go back on. For thrombolytic candidates, uh, I think it's uh, critical to push lytics before uh, placing them on ECMO, I think, uh, or pardon me, place them on ECMO before you give the lytics. Uh, there's nothing worse than trying to cannulate a patient who's received lytics. It, it usually is um, quite uh, bloody and not recommended. I think if you're gonna pull out mechanical circulatory support, you need to know what you're going to. We use it as a bridge here to a decision with eCPR. So our CPR, eCPR program here at Piedmont Atlanta is uh, quite vigorous. Uh, we do a, uh, probably the largest uh, center for uh, ECMO here in the state. And it is uh, used often as, as a bridge to figure out kind of where you're going uh, to recovery. Maybe this is through anticoagulation alone for your patients that have COVID pneumonia and then uh, suffer PE or through a procedure, can you get them through an embolectomy, either uh, percutaneous or uh, in, the, in the operating room? And then what about a bridge to destination? Uh, no one's really put any RBADs in these patients. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen, but it is another option for eCPR. I think as Jim mentioned, uh, ECMO, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, basically two types, VV ECMO um, for mainly oxygenation only, and VA ECMO for full uh, support. 
Uh, it's essentially like a heart-lung bypass machine. Uh, this can get a little dicey uh, depending upon where your cannulas are and for clots in thrombus or clots in transit, I should say. Uh, when you have a, a 24 French venous cannula up into the right atrium, uh, it can bring in or suck in the uh, clot and clog your filter, uh, which can uh, we've had happen with our massive uh, PEs that we've placed on ECMO, and I think it's important to uh, take that into consideration. Again, uh, mechanical circulatory support with PE, it's basically a please put patients on it before uh, you give lytics and really comes down to a team approach. Again, this is where the PERT team is critical. And again, it's the often here, it's the emergency room, the interventionalist, uh, CG surgeon and pulmonary critical care working together uh, with time. You get some time to think once your patient is stable. Uh, what about giving lytics in these patients uh, or in any patients with massive PE? I think everyone's worried about one thing and that's uh, several, uh, basically uh, brain bleeding. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, if you don't know the indication, right, it's the gold standard to give lytics in massive PE. Uh, that's actually only been studied in one randomized control trial, just one of eight patients. And this uh, made it the gold standard because all patients that received um, streptokinase or lytics uh, survived. Everyone who got heparin alone with PE died. And this went on to uh, basically make lytics the gold standard for massive PE. If you look at the rates of intracranial hemorrhage uh, using lytics, uh, we see there's a difference between tenecteplase and alteplase. Uh, clearly, uh, there's a higher rate of intracranial hemorrhage with tenecteplase over alteplase. So I think that's important to take into consideration. And these are patients, as you can see here, across several studies that received anywhere between 100 milligrams and then reduced dose lytics as well. Uh, again, if you're talking about uh, surgery, it's if contraindicated for lytics. Uh, if they're stable for the OR, I think in the setting of COVID-19, our, our operating room has really wanted to try to avoid uh, COVID-positive patients. Again, getting these patients down to the OR is another issue. Uh, so for massive PE, viable option is uh, to do surgery and you, know, you get nice large uh, chunks like this. I think not, likely not gonna happen during COVID. Uh, but for your massive PE uh, in experience centers, uh, you can really get some nice results with open surgery. What about catheter-directed therapy? Again, for those patients that fail thrombolysis or, or shock is impending before you can do anything from an open procedure, you can go on ACP. There's been a lot of uh, data out there about the efficacy of using catheter-directed therapy in a massive PE, uh, not in COVID, uh, but in massive PE. And I think we've uh, really have shown that uh, patients do do well with catheter therapy if you can get them uh, to that state, sometimes requiring um, ECMO before they even get down there. Again, you can suck out the uh, clot. Angiovac is a, a one technique that uh, is actually great for IVC clot or clot in thrombus. Uh, this catheter is quite large, uh, 24 French. It does not like to cross the right ventricle very well. It's, again, good for the SVC and IVC and RA. Uh, not very good for clot that's already out into the pulmonary artery. There's lots of new toys that are out there, including penumbra, aspiration catheters um, uh, that uh, I actually just used this afternoon uh, that are very uh, useful uh, for bringing out large amounts of clot. Uh, the Inari or flow retriever, you can remove it. Uh, this is a very uh, large uh, device, 21 French to 23 French, depending on which type you have, where you can go out and actually uh, use these discs to uh, capture clot and bring it back. Most of the time now, we're actually just doing a uh, clot. This is a case that we did with Benari. This is the uh, right lung looking uh, quite nice. This is not a COVID patient. This is the left PA. Uh, as you can see here, there's a large mobile thrombus uh, sitting in the left main PA. Uh, this was um, myself and Dr. Ross, one of our vascular surgeons, working closely together using the Inari. And what we use is a, a high stiff very stiff wire here, an Amplats one centimeter uh, tip wire to basically rail this out across to the RV with this 22 French catheter and then essentially do flash suction aspiration. And what, what you wind up with uh, afterwards is uh, the thrombus is gone. Uh, you can see great uh, mark of perfusion and uh, just your before and after pictures and a nice clot that comes out afterwards. And I think uh, this is myself and uh, Dr. Ross, one of our, our chief of vascular surgery, uh, working together on Friday night uh, doing this case at nine o'clock. And I think what this shows is that teamwork is critical for this and really you wanna bring, um, especially in the setting of COVID, as Jim mentioned, you're working together with your pulmonologist, your critical care docs, uh, your cardiologists, your uh, nursing teams, everyone needs to work together uh, along with your PERT teams that optimize the outcomes of these patients. Uh, here's a risk stratification looking at ACS and venothromboembolism. Again, this is from that JAK paper. 
Uh, you can look at low risk COVID uh, versus high risk COVID. And I think the key thing here, this is for acute coronary syndrome and anti uh, for VTE. Uh, and really, if you look at the high risk group uh, here, you look talking about consider uh, systemic fibrinolysis, uh, fire, catheter directed surgical therapies in case not suitable for that. Um, we're not seeing a lot of those cases. We're again, our, most of our cases here in Atlanta haven't been stable enough to get down to the lab, but that's another option. And I think if you go back uh, to our case, what did we do? Uh, this is a 50 year old near sync of me, shortness of breath, uh, no prior history. He's got a settle fee. He's got COVID positive pneumonia. He's intubated in the ICU. And we wound up treating with low molecular weight heparin alone. Uh, the patient actually uh, did well uh, and stabilized out uh, alone just with low molecular weight heparin. We did wind up not giving lytics. And I think this is a good case because it illustrates that sometimes the best thing to do is nothing at all. And sometimes that's hard to do. So I think for treatment of PE and COVID, I think stay calm, resist intubation if you can. I think with patients that have PE uh, or coming in with COVID and PE intubation, uh, sometimes it's just simply required. Upfront stabilization principles, as noted, uh, really mechanical circulatory support is often critical in these patients and getting it uh, on board early is critical. Limiting exposure, really trying to limit the amount of exposure these patients to, uh, to limit your exposure to your staff. Uh, is critical, uh, and I'll be interested to hear Jim's experience on that. And I think the first, second, third, and fourth principle here is prevention, and I think getting patients on adequate anticoagulation up front, low molecular weight heparin or uh, sub-Q heparin at high doses, 7500 TID, is critical. You really want to prevent this from happening. Um, these patients are extremely ill, and they don't often tolerate uh, an additional insult, such as a pulmonary embolism. And only really consider treatment for massive PE. And there we're really talking about lytics as Jim's case really highlighted here. Reduce or full dose, we don't know. I think we're looking forward to see uh, maybe some data from the registry uh, that is going out right now through the PERT registry for, uh, for that. And with that, I'll say thank you. This is our PERT team. Again, this is uh, underscoring the importance of team. Teamwork, this is our, uh, I don't know how it is in Mexico, but there's often uh, battles here in the United States between vascular surgeons and interventional cardiologists. And here we all work very closely together. Everyone here on this side is our, our vascular surgeons. Here's our interventional cardiology team. And everyone works together to optimize these patients' outcome. With that I'll say thank you very much and I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you. And uh, um, First, I thank you for your commitment and your help and sharing your experience uh, with us in Mexico. But I just want to ask you something about the, the, um, the use of echocardiogram, because you can identify some things that uh, might put you, might aware you that the patient is going in the wrong direction, like uh, finding uh, the venous thrombosis or a, a right ventricular enlargement or so. So are you using echo at the, at the um, coronary care unit? If the question could be for either, either of you. Yeah, Jim, uh, Jim I'll, I'll start and I'll be, I'm sure Jim's, I'm sure he's using it. We absolutely are. We're using point of care echo. Uh, we talked about using, uh, if you can do point of care echo to look for DVTs in the patients that have COVID. Uh, before uh, they release and therefore intensifying anticoagulation and or considering filter placement in these patients uh, at the bedside under ultrasound. Jim, what's your experience and are you guys using, I imagine you're using point of care or ultrasound as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my case shows me doing a transesophageal echo, which is, you know, kind of the, the highest uh, acuity you can, you can do. But in real life, the day to day, we were doing point of care and in fact, um, you know, early on, we were just, we were ordering echoes. And, you know, when people get admitted to an ICU, the intensivists always order an echo. So our techs were going in, uh, but then there was a concern that the techs could, could get infected. For instance, are, the, are, your, are your echo technicians trained in how to don an N95? I bet you the answer is no. And so um, what happened was we went from, we went very rapidly from, uh, our standard of care, which is the tech goes in with the full echo machine, puts the leads on, does the whole protocol, measures things at bedside to, uh-uh. Every echo is looked at, every echo request is looked at by an attending and says, does this require a full echo or not? Or can you do point of care, number one. Number two, if it requires a full echo, that tech has to be trained and, and put it on an N95 
and we stop using tele the, the telemetry leads and we stop doing real time measurement of anything. So you got your pictures and you got out. And then uh, going back to um, uh, the point of care echo, we quickly realized the other difficulty was that an echo machine, whether it's an echo machine or a point of care machine, they're, they're big devices and they're difficult to clean. There's a lot of areas and cracks and crevices to clean. Um, and we went from using our point of care machines to very small probes, either from, at our place we used the Philips Lumify. It literally is a probe this big, you know, there's a cardiac probe and there's a vascular probe. It's got a USB cable and it plugs into an, um, an Android tablet or phone and you just do the study at bedside. And we actually were lucky enough that we had just set up, um, right before COVID, we had gotten uh, set up a protocol with, our, with Epic where you could order a point of care study in Epic and it would upload the name to the tablet just like a real echo machine. So you could open the study and acquisition it. And then it would push the images back to Epic. So we kind of, um, we developed this protocol that I thought was pretty unique where basically an intensivist or a, um, ED doc could take some pictures of the heart, it would upload to Echo, and now it would have the Echo Lab overread the images. And that would help us decide if we needed a full Echo, and it was much less to clean. So we used Philips Lumify. Um, other folks used the Butterfly Probe because that plugs into anyone's personal iPhone. And we'd look at the heart, we'd look at the lungs, we'd look for lung sliding, a lot of pneumothoraxes, pneumothoraces, and look for DVTs. That's great, that's great info, yeah. You, you want something, do you, do you have uh, something else to add, Andrew? No, the uh, Butterfly Echo has been great here at our, in our, uh, basically because everyone has an iPhone and uh, at our institution, so it plugs right up. And I think the ability to interface with your medical record, that's, that's even better. I just need to, fortunately, still working on that with our IT folks here. But I think understanding the evaluation uh, or how Echo, and I think this is, important because we as cardiologists are very used to using echocardiography and the intensivists have really come on board here and embraced it full full bore have gone from fast scans in the ER for trauma now to looking for pneumothoraces and being able to really do stuff at the bedside and so I think uh, being savvy with your point of care ultrasound is is critical. You surely uh, have experience with uh, patients with atrial fib and they come with a NOAC and uh, what you do in those cases, because we know that NOAX uh, can go uh, very up in, in, um, in their effect. So um, when, when you have COVID and when you use also uh, some other kind of medications like remdesivir and all those things. So you surely take it off and use, use heparin, but when is the time, the proper time to put them once again on a knock, if they make it. Jim, I, I don't know if you want to address this. I know there's some, some data about yeah. for patients that have high risk uh, features. Uh, there's a trial ongoing right now looking at one month of full uh, DOAC uh, on discharge um, because they do have a high risk after their procedure. Uh, I'd be curious to see what other people are doing. I mean, if you already came in because you have atrial fib or some other indication, that's easy. But I think, you know, in terms of on discharge, uh, actually in that uh, Barnes paper, uh, they actually address that as well. So there's some, it's a little controversial. No one really knows what's best. Jim, what are you doing in New York? Yeah, again, I agree. The, we don't know what's best, but given the, the just the, 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 all the number, the number of class we've seen, we've actually, dis, we're discharging people on, on, on usually river oxygen for at least a month, maybe a few months. And, and we're what, collecting the data now. And the doses? Of Rivaroxima? I believe they're using, you know, based on, uh, was it Magellan? Um, they just got the new indication for uh, chronically ill patients for DVT prophylaxis. So I think that we've been using that, is it 10 maybe milligrams? 10. 10. Might be. Yeah, I think it's a, a 10 milligrams and or uh, 15 as well. That's another uh, another option. Yeah. I think for some of these patients, you know, as we yeah. see here, especially post-op, they, they, the they depends on the risk. Exactly. I think one of the things I, and I'd be curious to hear Jim's experience on this is that one thing in contrast to H1N1, where we saw a lot of bleeding in the lungs, 
uh, I have not personally seen a ton of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, and I think uh, it's been more of a clotting thing than a hemorrhage thing. Jim, have you seen a lot of that? Um, no, I really haven't. And I mean, we've certainly, you know, our, our site was much more aggressive with the full dose anticoagulation than other sites that uh, I've spoken to. So, um, you know, we've had our share of bleeds and brain bleeds and things like that. But I honestly, in, in eight weeks of ICU, I can't think of any frank hemoptysis from the ET tube. Lots and lots of tubes that were clogged with secretions um, because, you know, the, because of the disease and because we were trying, because everyone's trying to minimize um, going into the room and, and suctioning and having super spreader events, but, but definitely not a lot of bleeds. Well, one else, are you considering the use of aspirin in the middle of it? Because we know there's damage in the, uh, in the telium. Yeah. I, I think it's a good question. I mean, when we were, when we were going through this, this was like, you know, early, early to mid March, we had none of the autopsy results. Uh, our center actually had some of the earliest autopsy results in the U S and, and now has done, um, there's a New York times article like today with, I think like 80 cases from, from NYU, but we didn't know about the, about the, uh, the, the microangiopathy or, or the megakaryocytes or any of that stuff at the time. So we were going with anticoagulants, not antiplatelets. But that's why I said, I think that, you know, when this, when our trial goes to NIH, they might, it sounds like they're going to add an, an antiplatelet arm, which I think will be really interesting. Jim, have you, uh, one of the questions that have been asked here is that, have you seen any cases of arterial thrombosis in patients with pulmonary embolism? I know we've seen young people with strokes, arterial emboli. Um, and the, the other, the follow-up with that is that there, uh, the, some people are following a protocol with anti-10A and seeing thrombotic events, even with quote unquote therapeutic anti-10A for your uh, patients who are on anoxaparin. Uh, first of all, the arterial thrombosis, have you seen it? What are you doing? And number two, the anti-10A, are you following that? Or are you going higher? What's your kind of go-to there? We've seen a decent number of strokes. I haven't seen, I haven't heard of any other arterial beds uh, with clots. Um, you know, because even though it's, it's, it's a funny disease, it's, it's DIC-like, but it's not quite DIC. You know, there's, there's definitely hypercoagulability, but it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not typical of many of the diseases. So I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to the second part. I mean, I, I think we've been doing PTTs mostly in my place, but I don't really have more info on that. And I think the other question uh, was, uh, if you say so you're following PTTs, are you following any anti-10A levels? Uh, we mo definitely on the, on the ECMO patients that we, that we had, we had about 30 ECMO patients for sure on those patients, but, uh, not, I you can't, know, honestly, I, I can't remember. Um, there's a lot of things about, um, about working during a pandemic that, uh, <laughs> become a blur yeah. and it takes you sort of months to unpack them. I mean, I'm still unpacking it, you know, still sort of trying, mostly you're just running, uh, mm -hmm. and, and trying to keep people safe and, and, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, like when this happened in March, we were, we were, we had no idea if, I mean, how many healthcare providers would get sick or die. And I mean, luckily it seemed like not many got sick at my place. Um, and the ones that got sick, you know, may have gotten it from going to the drugstore. You know, we had outpatient doctors who got sick, but we had every, you know, we tripled our capacity of inpatient doctors. And I heard of no one in my place, luckily, who got sick and admitted to our place or intubated or anything like that. So I think, you know, you see pictures from China and, and who knows what's true and what's not true, but they have like the Tyvek big suits. We had none of that. We had, we, we had N95s, we had standard gowns, we had face shields, many of that were homemade uh, by, by uh, medical students and 3D printing companies for us. And that seemed to be enough. That's very reassuring. I would just focus on the careful, carefully donning and doffing these things and making sure for the first hundred times you do it, you have somebody watch you do it. Yeah, and that's uh, for, uh, for those of you who are not used to doing that, uh, there are available on the CDC websites on, on how to don and doff these. Uh, I know we've, we had, unfortunately, uh, several patients who were pregnant with COVID, uh, which uh, with a cardiomyopathy and shock and delivering. And uh, that's where our anti-10A levels uh, were really being followed because obviously it can't be on heparin. And, and that's, uh, those are the cases that all, uh, we had a success story here of a mom delivering twins and she was on uh, ECMO wow. for about a week. And 
um, the twins uh, recovered well and uh, she recovered well off ECMO, but at the same respect, there's nothing worse than uh, seeing that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, hopefully um, we'll, we won't see any more of it. Uh, I know pregnancy definitely, that's where your anti-10 levels, we definitely follow those. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's been great, very enlightening for us. And I have to thank also um, Sky for um, their, um, they're always uh, uh, being uh, very uh, facilitating help and, and everything. So um, I just want to thank you, Andrew, very much for uh, your, your talk and James. Also, it's been very enlightening, as, as I said. And I, we will see each other in the next time, next week. Eh, vamos a, I'm just going to change to Spanish now. Y, no problema. Y, <laughs> <laughs> bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Les voy a dar la palabra al doctor Gigal Piña para que haga los anuncios correspondientes. Creo que la sesión ha sido muy enriquecedora. Primero del diagnóstico, luego de los puntos de corte que ellos están usando con su gran experiencia, también de los dispositivos acerca del equipo de respuesta rápida de eh, trombombolismo pulmonar, Y, y creo que es de muchísima ayuda para todos nosotros que estamos ahora en el centro, en el medio de la pandemia. Quiero agradecerles a ambos por su ayuda y por su disposición para eh, tener este Zoom, eh, que ha sido muy enriquecedor. Por favor, llegar. Gracias, Jorge. Thanks, Dr. Andrew and Dr. Horowitz. It was an amazing lecture with very difficult cases and were resolved very well. So, Switching to Spanish, los espero la próxima semana, miércoles 8, 5 de la tarde, para escuchar la plática sobre oclusión total crónica con el doctor Brilakis y como coordinador Marco Alcántara. Les agradezco mucho su atención. Nos vemos hasta la próxima. Hasta luego. Saludos a todos. Gracias.